There's very few computational problems that complex that mankind has, you know, undertaken. So of napkin math, 175 billion parameters, 350 billion floating point operations, three times 10 to the 23. And that's a completely crazy number. Got it, got it. Expectation at the moment is that the cost uh, for training these models may actually sort of top out or, or even go down a little bit. How do you think about the relationship between compute, capital, and then the technology that we have today? Yeah, that's a, that's a million dollar question or maybe trillion dollar question, I don't know. With software becoming more important than ever, hardware is following suit. And with the world constantly generating more data, unlocking the full potential of AI means a constant need for faster and more resilient hardware. But how much does all of this really cost? In this final segment of our AI hardware series, we tackle that question head on. But if you're just catching up, be sure to check out part one and part two, where we explored the emerging architectures and the momentous competition for AI hardware. And today, we're joined again by A16Z Special Advisor, Guido Appenzeller, someone who is uniquely suited for this deep dive as a storied infrastructure expert. CTO for Intel's data center group dealing a lot with hardware and the low-level components. So it's given me sort of, I think, a good insight how large data centers work, you know, what the, the, the basic components are that make all of this AI boom, uh, you know, possible today. Here is Guido touching on the reality of these models and how much they cost today. Training one of these large language models today is, it's not a hundred thousand dollar thing, it's probably millions of, of, of dollars thing. Um, practically speaking, what we're seeing in industry is that it's actually more of a tens of millions of dollars thing. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only. Should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security, and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. Please note that A16Z and its affiliates may also maintain investments in the companies discussed in this podcast. For more details, including a link to our investments, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. In Guido's recent article, Navigating the High Cost of AI Compute, Guido even noted that access to compute resources has become a determining factor for the success of AI companies. And this is not just true for the largest companies building the largest models. In fact, many companies are spending more than 80% of their total capital raised on compute resources. We've specifically seen that with, with founders that want to train their own models, right? Which is extremely expensive. I mean, you have to spend a large chunk of your, your funding just on compute capacity. Right? And they often run with very small and lean teams, right? That's, that's the plus side. Over time, I would expect this to normalize a little bit. And it's mostly as you go more from the, the core technology that you're building in your early days towards more a complete product offering, right? There's just a lot more boxes to check and you know features to implement and all the administrative parts of your application if you're, if you're getting to the enterprise. So probably you'll have more normal software development that's not AI, right, or classic software development happening. Uh, you'll probably also have a larger headcount of people that, that, um, uh, that you have to pay. So at the end of the day, I would expect as a percentage that it will go down over time, right? As an absolute amount, I think it'll be going up for some time just because this AI boom is uh, still just in its infancy. The AI boom has just begun. And in part two, we discussed how it's unlikely for compute demand to subside anytime soon. There, we also discussed how the decision to own or rent infrastructure can make a non-trivial difference to a company's bottom line. But there are other considerations when it comes to cost. Batch size, learning rate, and the duration of the training process all contribute to the final price tag. How much does it cost to train a model depends on a myriad of factors, right? Now, the, the good news is we can simplify this a little bit because the vast majority of models that are being used today are transformer models, right? That's, that was the transformer architecture. Huge breakthrough in AI. They've proven to be incredibly versatile. They're easier to train because they paralyze um, a little bit better than previous models. And so in a, in a transformer, you can sort of approximate the inference time as twice the number of parameters uh, floating point operations, right? And the the uh, training time is about six times the number of parameters. So if you take something like GPT-3, right, which is, you know, the OpenAI's big model, they have 175 billion uh, parameters. So you need twice as much, so 350 billion floating point operations to do one inference. 
And so, you know, so based on that, you can sort of figure out how much compute capacity you need, how this is going to scale, how you should, should, uh, you should price it, you know, how much it'll cost you at the end of the day. This also gives you for model training an idea how long the training is going to take. You know how much your AI accelerator uh, can do in terms of floating point operations per second, right? You can sort of theoretically calculate how many operations it is to, to train your model. In practice, the math is more complicated because, uh, you know, you, there are certain ways to accelerate that. So maybe you can train with a reduced precision, but there's, it's also very hard to achieve 100% utilization on these cards. If you naively implement it, you're gonna be, probably going to be below 10% utilization. But, you know, you can probably get into the tens of percent with a little bit of, um, uh, with a little bit of work. This sort of gives you a rough swag, how much capacity you need for training and for inference. But at the end, you probably do want to test it before you uh, make any final decisions uh, on these things and make sure that your assumptions hold on, on uh, how much you need. Now, if all those numbers confused you, that's okay. We'll walk through a very specific example, GPT-3. GPT-3 has about 175 billion parameters. And here's Guido on the computation requirements for training the model and ultimately inference. That's when you're prompting the already trained model to elicit a response. So if you if you just do very naively the math, right, let's start with training, right? We know how many tokens it was trained on. We know how many parameters the model has. Uh, so we can, the soft napkin math. And you end up with something like three times 10 to the 23 floating point operations. And that's a completely crazy number, right? It's like a, a number with 23 digits, right? It's like hard, hard to write down. There's very few computational problems that complex that mankind has, has actually, you know, undertaken, right? This is, this is like, it's a, it's a huge effort. If you then you can be like, okay, so let's take, uh, say, an A100, right? Uh, the most commonly used card. Uh, we know how many floating point operations it can do per second. We can divide that, right? That sort of gives us an order of magnitude estimation like how much time it would take, right? And then we know how much one of these cards costs, right? You know, like a renting an, an A100 costs you between, I want to say between one and four dollars probably, right? Depending on, on um, who you rent it from. And you end up with something in the order of half a million dollars, right? With this very, very naive analysis. Now, there's a couple of things there, right? We didn't take into account optimization. We also didn't take into account that they, you probably cannot run this at, um, at full capacity because of memory bandwidth limitations and network limitations. Um, and, you know, last but not least, you probably need more than one run to get this right. <laughs> you probably need a bunch of test runs. They're probably not going to be full runs and so on. But, you know, this gives you an idea that sort of training one of these large language models today is it's not a hundred thousand dollar thing. It's probably millions of, of, of dollars thing. Um, practically speaking, what we're seeing in industry is that it's actually more of a tens of millions of dollars thing. <laughs> and that's because you need the reserve capacity, right? So if I could get all my cards for the next two months uh, would only cost me a million dollars, but the problem is they want a two year reservation, right? So uh, really the, the cost is, uh, you know, 12 times as high. And, uh, you know, so that basically adds a zero uh, to, my, to my training cost. Right, and how does that compare to inference? So inference is much, much, much cheaper. Basically for a modern text model, for example, the training set is about a trillion tokens, right? And if I run inference, each letter, so each word that comes out is, is one token. Right, so it's a factor of a trillion or so, uh, you know, faster in, in, in the, on the inference part. You know, if you run the numbers, like a large language model, you actually at a, at a fraction of a cent, like a tenth of a cent or a hundredth of a cent, somewhere in that, in that ballpark, um, for the inference. Again, if we just naively look at this, right? For inference, your problem is usually that you have to provision for peak capacity, right? So if everybody wants to use your model at 9 a.m. on a Monday, right, uh, you still have to pay for, you know, Saturday, Saturday night at, at midnight when nobody's using it, right? That, that increases your cost substantially there. For some of them on specifically image models, what you can do for inference is that you use much, much cheaper cards because they, the model is small enough that you can run it on essentially the server version of a consumer graphics card. And, and that, that can save you a lot of cost. And unfortunately, as we discussed in part one, you can't just make up for these inefficiencies by piecing together a bunch of less performant chips, at least for model training. At least you need some, some very sophisticated software for that, right? And, and because the, the overhead of distributing the data between these cards would probably outweigh any saving you get from, from cheaper cards. Inference, on the other hand, for inference, you can often do the inference on a single card, so that's not really a problem. If you take something like Stable Diffusion, right, a very popular model for image generation, um, you know, that runs that, that runs on a, on a MacBook, for example, out of, uh, you know, that, that has enough memory and enough compute power so you can generate an, an image locally. So that'll run on a, a relatively cheap consumer card, and you don't have to, to use an A100 for it um, to do inference. 
So when we're talking about the training of the models, clearly the the amount of compute is just drastically more than the inference. And something else that we've already talked about is the more compute, often, not always, but often the better model. And so does this ultimately, these factors all ladder up to the idea that heavily capitalized incumbents win this race or this competition? Or how do you think about the relationship between compute, capital, and then the technology that we have today? Yeah, that's a, that's a million dollar question or maybe trillion dollar question. I don't know. So first of all, training these models is expensive, right? For example, the, the we haven't seen uh, yet a really good uh, open source large language model. Well, I'm, I'm sure part of the reason is that training these models is just really, really expensive, right? I mean, there's a bunch of enthusiasts out there that would love to do this, but uh, you know, you need to find uh, a couple of million or $10 million of, of compute capacity to do it. And, and that makes it so much harder, right? And, and means you sort of need to create a substantial effort before, uh, before something like that can happen. Um, all that said, you know, the, the cost for training these models overall seems to be coming down, right? Um, and in part, I think it is because it seems to me like, like we're, we're becoming data limited, right? So the, it turns out there is a, there is a, a correspondence between how big your model is and what the, uh, the optimal amount of training data is for the model. Right? So having a super large model with very few data doesn't, doesn't get you anything, or, you know, having a ton of data with a small model also doesn't get you anything, right? You sort of the, the size of your brain needs to roughly correspond to the length of your university education here, right? <laughs> like, otherwise it, it doesn't work. What this means is that, you know, because some of the large models today already leverage uh, a good percentage of all human knowledge in a particular area, right? I mean, the if you look at uh, you know GPT, it was probably trained on something like ten percent of of the of the internet, right? And all of Wikipedia and many books, like a good good chunk of all books, right? So, so going up by a factor of ten, yeah, that's probably possible. Going up by a factor of a hundred. It's not clear if, if that's possible. I mean, we, we as mankind just haven't produced enough knowledge yet that you could absorb all of that into one of these large models. And and so I think the the expectation at the moment is that the the cost uh, for training these models, you know, may actually sort of top out or, or even go down a little bit. You know, as as the the chips get faster, but we we don't discover new training material as quickly. I mean, unless somebody comes up with a new idea to generate training material. If that assumption is true, I think this means that the moat that's created by these large capital investments is actually not particularly deep, right? It's, it's more of a speed bump than, uh, than you know, something that prevents new entrants. I mean, today, training a large language model is something that is definitely within reach for a well-funded startup, right? So, and for that reason, we expect to see more innovation uh, in that area in the future. All right, that is a wrap for our AI hardware series. We genuinely hope you came away with a little more knowledge about this increasingly important space. Because if software is indeed eating the world, well, hardware is coming along for that ride. And as a reminder, if you haven't yet listened to part one, where we explore the emerging architectures and who's creating them, or part two, where we dive into the future AI stack and how founders can participate, well, those are already live and ready for consumption. And as always, Thank you so much for listening. We'd actually like to leave you with a fun fact from GPT-4 itself, commenting on the technology that created it. And yes, we did fact check this. And this is also AI generated audio from Eleven Labs. Chat GPT and its sibling models are trained on diverse internet text. However, the exact amount of data used can be hard to comprehend. If we were to print all of the data used to train these models, it could fill a large library. Consider that one single book may contain around 1 million characters. If we estimate that the training data is hundreds of gigabytes of text data, let's take a conservative estimate and say it's 100 gigabytes. Considering that one character is approximately one byte, this would mean the model was trained on approximately 100 billion characters. If each book has 1 million characters, then the data used to train ChatGPT is equivalent to the text in approximately 100 million books. If we take the size of a large library, such as the New York Public Library, which has around 53 million items, not just books, the training data is equivalent to the text in almost twice the number of items in that library. Thanks, ChatGPT. A quick note to close out that many models today are even bigger, with Llama 2, for example, being trained on 2 trillion tokens or about 8 trillion characters. Now that is a lot of libraries. We'll see you next time.
Thank you so much for listening to the A16Z podcast. What we're trying to do here is provide an informed, clear-eyed, but also optimistic take on technology and its future. And we're trying to do that by featuring some of the most inspiring people and the things that they're building. So if that is interesting to you and you'd like to join us on this journey, go ahead and click subscribe and make sure to let us know in the comments below what you'd like to see us cover next. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.